Hello, I'm your professor, Dr. Stephen Haggard, and today I want to talk to you about the importance of cash. In finance, we talk about three big questions. The first one is called capital budgeting, and it's all about deciding what items you're going to buy or invest in that are going to provide you value for more than one year into the future. So that's kind of how we define capital, is it has a benefit greater than one year or maturity greater than one year. And then we have the capital structure question, which is how am I going to finance those assets from the first question? And of course your two basic ways are debt and equity, but you know there's little variations of different kinds of debt and equity like common stock, preferred stock, convertible debt, straight debt, and so forth, bank loans. And then the third one, the third question, is the working capital management question, and that is how are we going to manage our cash flows in the short term? Now in finance and accounting, short term always means one year or less. And so that's what we're really talking about, is what are we going to do over the next year to manage our cash? And when I ask people which of those questions they think is the most important, invariably they will choose one of the first two questions, capital structure or capital budgeting, because they're sexier, they're more exciting, there's something exotic and big and, and bold about them. Unfortunately, they're wrong. It turns out that that third question, how are we going to manage our short-term cash flows, is far more important. And here's why. Just ask yourself this, why do firms go bankrupt? Firms go bankrupt because they run out of cash. As long as you have cash to pay your bills, then you'll be fine. Now we'll get into a little more of where cash comes from, but that's the, the key point here. This is the reason this question is the most important. It's because cash prevents bankruptcy. Okay, so let's talk about accounting numbers. Accounting numbers aren't any help. Why aren't accounting numbers any help? If you look at an income statement, you could have a firm that's got a positive net income. And you'd say, oh, well, they must have plenty of cash coming in. And here's what I mean by accounting numbers don't help. Positive net income doesn't mean positive cash flow. And here's why. You could have all a, a bunch of sales, but if those sales are not in cash, they're not producing cash. They're producing what's called an accounts receivable, which is basically money your customer owes you. You can't spend that on an electric bill or down at the grocery store. And so that's why we say that accounts receivable accounting numbers don't reflect cash. Also, when you go out and buy something, that may consume cash or it might not. If you buy it on credit, all you're going to have coming out of that is an accounts payable. It's not going to impact your cash immediately. And so there's a lot of fogginess in these accounting numbers when it comes to talking about uh, trying to relate them to cash. Now I do realize that they've got the accounting statement of cash flows and all that, and, and there is some good valuable information there, but my point to you is this. From an income statement, you cannot tell whether a company is cash flow positive or negative. Okay, now, what does that mean? It means that firms that are profitable, defined as those with a positive net income, can go bankrupt because they can run out of cash. It also means that firms with negative net income, consistently negative net income, can continue to stay in business. And you say, how can that be? And there's really three ways these people can get money. Number one, they can sell additional stock in the firm. Now they've got to find some uninformed folks that would be willing to buy it or people who are gambling on some sort of turnaround, but they can't issue additional stock to stay in business. They could also issue additional debt. And once again, you got to find people who are willing to buy that debt 
But we've seen time and time again that you usually can find people like that. I'll use General Motors back in the mid-2000s as an example of that. And then finally, uh, the firm might have some assets that they could sell to raise cash. And my example for this one is Sears. Sears just keeps selling assets to raise cash because they continue to lose money. Now, at some point though, they are going to run out of assets and that's going to be a real problem for them because they don't have anything else to sell and hopefully everyone by now is smart enough not to buy more of their stock or not to loan them any more money. Okay, and so now we know that you can be profitable and go bankrupt. You could be unprofitable and stay in business as long as you can find cash somewhere to pay your bills. Now, unfortunately, as a small business, you're probably not going to have the opportunity to sell stock or bonds to uninformed investors, and you probably aren't sitting on a mountain of assets to sell for cash. So what can you do? Well, let's start with some preventative measures. Think about your cash inflows and your cash outflows. Now, it's helpful to forecast these things on the smallest time period possible. But if you were to try to forecast them on a daily basis, there would probably be a huge amount of volatility there. You don't know whether you're going to be receiving a check in the mail today or tomorrow. And so it's really hard to do. And so you could do this on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis. And a quarter, of course, the longer the time period that you look at, the more accurate your forecasts are because you don't have as much volatility in that long time period number. Now, on the other hand, a shorter time period is more helpful for the exercise that we're about to undertake. It's more informative. So you kind of got to balance these things. We typically look at quarterly cash budgets when we talk about these things with students. But sometimes I think the only reason we do that is because we uh, gives us fewer numbers to work with and makes it a little simpler. If I were doing this for my own business, I would probably be doing it on a monthly basis. And so what do I do? I look at cash that I predict will be coming in, and I want to be conservative with that. If a customer always pays late, should you assume they're going to pay on time this month? I don't think so. And let's look also at cash outflows. If you in the past haven't exercised some restraint with the things that you purchase or money that you spend on your business, should you expect that you will suddenly develop new restraint in this area? I don't think so. And so you want to be conservative and realistic and looking at these cash flows to make sure that you are uh, getting a reasonable estimate because here's what we're going to do we're going to take those cash inflows predicted and subtract out our predicted cash outflows and look at the difference now if that difference is positive and you started out from a decent cash position then you're in good shape congratulations on the other hand if that change in cash is negative now you need to start asking some questions. If you started off with a situation where you had more cash than you needed, maybe you'll be okay. Maybe you don't need to do anything. But what if you were keeping just the bare minimum amount of cash and now suddenly you see you're going to have a negative cash flow month? You've got to do something about that or you could easily find yourself in a bind. Now, a lot of people find themselves in a bind and they find out the hard way where they need cash now and they don't have it. And when that happens, what happens is these people go out and they borrow money from some type of loan shark or a legalized version thereof and end up paying a high interest rate for that money. With a little planning, you can look ahead into the future and predict where these cash uh, shortcomings are going to happen. And so what do you do at that point? I would tell you to visit with your banker. And here's why. 
Your banker probably has already loaned some money to you. And so your banker has a vested interest in you not going bankrupt. And so what you can do is go to your banker and let them know about this cash situation. Of course, you want to take all your financial reports with you so your banker knows that you're in good financial shape. Otherwise, that this is a, this is a, a short-term aberration, perhaps. And if it's a short-term problem, for instance, you're building up inventory for the holiday season, then I would suggest that you talk to your banker about a short-term loan. You want to solve short-term problems with short-term loans because short-term loans have lower interest rates than long-term loans. But what if your shortage of cash is as a result of buying a big piece of equipment that's going to give you many years of service? For example, you just bought a new pizza oven for your pizza restaurant. Should you try to buy that with short-term loan? Absolute, absolutely not because you could easily find yourself in a cash crunch when that loan comes due. So in this case, you would want to get a loan whose term more closely matched that of the life of the item. And that way you're not going to put yourself in a situation where you're constantly having to refinance that borrowed money for that long-term asset. One of my favorite stories of financing long-term assets with short-term money is City Center in Las Vegas. And if you've ever been to City Center in Las Vegas, it's just up the strip from New York, New York. And they've got Vidara and the Manor and Oriental. The thing's so big, it has its own fire department. Now, it's its own fire station. Now, here's the deal, though. When they were building that back during the boom prior to the financial crisis, they were funding the whole thing with short-term money because short-term money has a lower interest rate and they said to themselves, hey, we can always go out and refinance at the end of these, I think they were 270 day periods. Now, that works just fine as long as credit markets are liquid and everybody's happy. But then the financial crisis hit and they couldn't refinance that project on a bet. And they ended up having to take on a lot of money from a Middle Eastern sovereign wealth fund who now owns a great deal of the equity in that project. Which means that now going forward, the people who were doing that project have to share the profits with those investors because after all, those people are equity investors. So once again, don't try to solve your long-term cash problems with a short-term loan. You're just asking for trouble. Okay, now, if uh, you have any questions, please put them in the comments down below. Or if you have other topics that you'd like for me to uh, discuss, I'd be glad to do that. Also, if you like this video, please subscribe. And if you want to receive a notification when I post a new video, just click on that little bell. And, uh, of course, you could always hit the like button. I don't know if I already mentioned that, but you could always hit the like button if you like the video and, and hopefully help other people to be able to find it and find it helpful for their own work, too. Thanks for watching.